succeed because I have dealt with so many. I can tell you when I had a Kwanguka, another one I say don't even try. I sell vehicles, but don't try. Because when they come to you, they don't have a compelling story. They, they don't believe, they don't understand the industry they want to get into. So, don't waste your money. But those who succeed, and I've seen them buy track one to track 400. Track one to track, they stay on course. Stay on their business is transportation, it's their anchor business. And they focus on it. They know it 360. They know their threats, they know their challenges, they know their opportunities. So they stay focused, they know their business, they are ruthless about costs. Always trying to cut costs so they can optimize their profits. They lead by example. Utakuta office wake. Early in the morning, I shall pick up and get it. First to arrive, last to leave. Especially in the formative time of an entrepreneurial journey, the honor gives putting a lot of effort. They pay debts. In our business, uh, most of our customers, they depend on bank financing. They cannot be able to raise the capital because the products are expensive. So they depend on bank financing. Especially at this point. The ones who succeed, they pay their debts. I'm sure there's a biblical teaching around paying of debts. If you can't pay, I used to have an old man, God bless his soul, he was one of my dealers. If he was not able to pay the debt for one reason or another, he will not call, he will come. He will come walking, take all the girls in the corridor. Hey, oh, you come, you come. Oh, the way to my place, I know he has a problem. <laughs> <laughs> he will not hide and dodge. He will come and say, Look, I'm going through this problem. I will not be able to pay the one million, but I will pay 250 and 250 and 250 and I will clear. If you are an entrepreneur or you dream to be one and you know you will not pay debt, remember I am an entrepreneur has got doesn't have much money. You depend on your goodwill. Trust. Will people can people trust me? Do I honor my commitment? Do I deliver on time? Do I keep my word? If you can do that, everyone, everybody in your value chain, your supplier and everyone, they will support. In 2016, there was a change in regulation. 2015, the rules came. 2016, interest cut came. Next, my business. Ordered a lot of vehicles, had a lot of inventory. I was not able to pay my supply for the first time in the history of the company. But because I used to pay them religiously, at seven days on the dot, they checked me with the bank. And I called them and told them, Look, we can buy. I will not be able. I have to reschedule all my payments. I reschedule the amount for a 
period of one year, I was struggling to pay them. COVID came, I was cash rich. I paid my supplier in time when everyone else was struggling to pay them. My little debt management, all the successful ones I've seen, debt management is a big one. Honest and integrity is another one. The ones that have succeeded, they are men of their work. They hire good, they pay well. We are successful in my organization because we share. We share with our employees. So in navigating your entrepreneurial journey, I believe you will now share. Whoever you hire, one or two, pay them well. They also have needs. Make sure you pay them well. I have something in my company we have we developed during COVID crisis. I uh, know that your students, we call it the corporate immune system. You know, we call it the immune system in COVID. For a business, we developed a framework. We, we wanted to find out what made us, what made us navigate through the crisis of COVID and emerge successfully. So we created our own framework and said these are the things we think as a company helped us to navigate. Because in your business, in your, in your entrepreneurial journey, there will be these type of things happening, so many uncertainties that will take you off your course. How will you stay stayed? One one is diversity, diversity of our team. Because we went to them and asked, what do we do? I'm the managing director, I didn't know what to do. But I went to the team and asked, what is it that we can do? And we were able to quickly agree, first let's go and donate. Time to give back. Let's go and donate water tanker to uh, NMS. People needed water. Let our engineer make food, pedal, uh, washing station. Let's take them to Mukuru, to our neighbors. Let's just go and do some community work. Let's go and give buses to K uh, Kenyatta University Farm or Hospital to carry the nurses and everybody around. First, to one the airport. So we did that. We used our capability to, to give back. As you do the entrepreneurial journey, giving back is a very important thing. Trust, building trust. We talked about trust quite a lot with your suppliers, with your employees, with your shareholders, with people who support you, even with your family. Health and safety. COVID was a health crisis first. Our culture taught about safety, metrics, so safety is important. When you are navigating your entrepreneurial journey, these products the lady is making here, are they safe? If I apply them, will I get blistered? Is that a safety culture you're promoting in the organization that we make safe products? So when you talk about COVID and the need for masks and all that, people who are talking about safety, they don't understand that faster than an organization where there is no set. Innovation. We became creative. We started to make those hand food pedals to supply water. We made water behind our, our trucks and we sent them to NMS. And we got a lot of business as a result of that, by the way. Because, because we donated them, we said we want like that one. So we ended up selling a lot of trucks in a crisis. Look for the opportunity. In any crisis as an entrepreneur, you must look for an opportunity. Every crisis has got great opportunity. So we went with a social good. 
we got business out of it. Are you volunteering? The company, uh, Professor said, volunteer. The company you're volunteering to could be looking for an IT person to hire, could be looking for someone like you to hire. Relationships. Build strong relationships. You must build strong relationships everywhere in everything we do. Whether you are an entrepreneur, an employee, a student, build strong relationships. They will come to help you. Communication. Communicate, communicate, communicate. And for young entrepreneurs yourself, you need to build your communication skill because you'll be selling your products. You'll be looking for a loan if you cannot engage with conviction. To a bank manager whom you are looking to get a loan, you're going there timidly, not well groomed, it will be a challenge. So learn to communicate and articulate the issues that you want to share. Financial immunity. As you do your business, you have to save some money for a rainy day. So you can still be able to pay your workers. Culture. They say culture is strategy for breakfast. What is the culture? Culture is, for me, the main issue. If you have a culture of honesty, you have a culture of integrity, you have a good culture, then you can run a fantastic business. And of course, community. Vitao is my community. He's staying with us. We're giving him an exposure to be able to learn uh, engineering before he gets to class. You are my community. I am volunteering to come here and share my experience, my idea, uh, to see whatever sentence you pick from my conversation with you this morning. It might help you to navigate, to learn more, to think more about what is it that you want to be. You are my community. So our organization thrives in community and in sharing our resources, our expertise. So those who feel the entrepreneurs and they want to be attached for three months at the South East Africa, see me after this. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. More applause, please. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you very much. Members, I don't want to tell you how much you could have paid for such a talk. I have attended many talks. I have paid for them. Rita, how much you do charge it? Let me not go there because I know what you will put. <laughs> because it is more the fees of the whole semester for the one hour, for the one hour talk. I don't want to go there. So thank you very much, uh, Rita. Yes, uh, kindly be drafting your questions. We will be getting to a plenary session after our second and uh, last uh, speaker. Uh, be drafting your questions and direct them to the specific speaker based on what you have heard from them. And I urge you students, kindly, let us remain. Let's have less movements unless it is completely very necessary. This is for you, not for us. We have closed our offices to be here with you. Please first close our office, very busy office, to be here with you and brought such people to talk to you. So kindly, let's have it. For our Muslim brothers and sisters who are going for prayers, you do it as quick as possible, like you always do, and then you are back. Kindly. Let me welcome Kota. Kota K W. I don't know, I was unable to pronounce. Kota is a student. And it is your function, so I cannot invite a guest. It is a student to invite a guest. Welcome, Kota, and invite our second speaker. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kota Mohammed, a student studying at Al and in the School of Business and Economics. I am here today to invite Dr. Bashir Mbaou. Dr. Bashir Mbaou is the CEO of Shell National, 
and it's my factoring company that specializes in, in natural hair and skin care products. She's a medic, an entrepreneur, and a philanthropist. A graduate of dental surgery at the University of Nairobi, she fought a new path in entrepreneurship after a short stint as a practicing dentist. However, the root canal had it of her entrepreneurship travels all the way back to the homes of residents at the university from the year 2008 when she took her initial chances at selling airtime and subsequently accessories for women as a way of supporting herself and her younger siblings. When Dr. Kasheri decided to embrace her natural hair in 2014, owing to her busy schedule as a dental intern at the Kenyatta National Hospital, she came face to face with the difficulty women in Kenya face finding products for natural hair. What was most unsettling for her though, as a medic, was the number of harmful ingredients that went into most beauty products. These were the same products available for use by most of the African population, not just in Kenya, but across Africa and the world. She embarked on a plan to call back Africans to embrace clean beauty the same one their forefathers used without encountering the many lifestyle diseases that are now characteristic of our society. It is out of this dream that Shell National was born. Her venture into the world of business did not diminish her quest for knowledge. Her pursuit of an MSc in health economics and policy speaks to her passion for the intersectionality of policy and practice for better development outcomes for the public. The African conversation, specifically its leadership, women and the youth are issues that are close to her heart. She values forums that foster this and is using her venture as one such forum. Through share, she seeks to empower women and the youth while cultivating essential leadership for the communities within which she operates. The Sherry is a public spirited Evidenced by her engagement to her local community in Karaka, where she grew up, she is passionate about empowering marginalized communities through shared community-based model in areas such as Kilipi and her own community, Karaka. She is also involved in offering free medical care to the locals in Karaka, Kilipi County, through her initiative, the M and K Foundation, named in, her, in honor of her late parents. Guys, join me in welcoming Dr. Kasheri Mugawi. Keep clapping, keep clapping, make it stronger until she lands here. My good Ameno, she's a dentist. Thank you, Dr. Susan, the faculty members, Kemu Entrepreneurship Class of 2022. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Good afternoon again. Good afternoon. For the students, congratulations for belonging to one of the clubs that is most likely going to shape the rest of your life. Maybe if I had belonged to an entrepreneurship class myself when I was at the university, my entrepreneurship journey would have been slightly different. But because I didn't, I am here to share what I have learned on this journey with you. I was too busy cutting dentine and enamel. I'm sure you remember what that looks like on your, bio, uh, on your biology books. So I didn't get the opportunity. But my closest interaction with Kemu University was when I had to wake my mother up because she was dozing while doing her classes and her reading <laughs> for her adult learning, which she was doing in Kemo, the Meru campus. So today I'm here to interact with the actual Kemo and not to look at it from the eyes of my mother and live through her vicariously. So I'm going to share my journey as an entrepreneur in two ways. I'm going to do it through a story, my story, because I enjoy stories. 
I'm a storyteller. But I'm going to do that on the PowerPoint presentation. As you may have heard from Rita, who just spoke before me, there is one thing I've always believed. It's something that I learned from the former president of the United States, Barack Obama. He said once when he was criticized for being told that he did nothing, he actually stood up and said, I believe and I concur with the person who said I do nothing because Michelle, my wife, by evening, so sorry, by evening will have a list of the nothing I will have done by evening. And so it is true that I may have done nothing as the President of the United States. And he said the truth about a title of anyone, including the President of the United States, is that it says very little about the success of anyone. There is always more to do, there will always be more to learn, and there will always be more to achieve, no matter who you are. Every single day, when you think people are celebrating you out there, when you get caught up in that clapping, that is when you decide to start falling. So you must always be ready, no matter where you are on your journey, to learn more, to achieve more, and to do more. So like you've heard from my introduction, my biography, I started at the University of Nairobi in 2007 as a dental student. I was pursuing a bachelor in dental surgery. I reported on the 15th of October 2007. And by December, which was about exactly six weeks, I lost my dad. My dad was the reason why I was very focused on my studies. My dad, I like to tell this story for every single day that I reported to school, I was involved in school from class five, walked with me to school and ensured my bed was spread, just so that I was sure that I had the support of my parents studying in school. He did the same just before I reported to school at the university. Came with me, spread my bed, ensured that my room was ready, and he left. And that was the last time I saw him. So when I lost my dad, I'm a pastor in my family. I looked at myself, I looked at my mother and I wondered, I have three other siblings. How was I going? As a big woman, because that's what I was, there was no difference between my mother and my reason, except that she had children and I had none. How was I going to stand and ask for pocket money from her? I had help. Do you guys have help? You do? Right. I had help. So I decided I was going to use my help to do something for myself. And I thought what that would be. So I figured, dental students, and medical students at large are very busy. They don't have the time to walk around looking for airtime. Those days, and like today when you can buy airtime on M-Pesa, you could only have bought airtime as a scratch. So, I discovered a place downtown where I will go and buy airtime and come sell to my classmates. Because over lunch hour, they have a very short time to rush out and come back in class. And then after that, in the evening when they are reading, there will be there's a building right here. Those of us that have interacted with the University of Nairobi, there's a building about here called ADD. It's for the architectural students. But everyone seems to have gone to ADD if you are intending to learn and read for your exams and just ensure that you are good as a student. So they will be at any meeting late into the night and calling each other for paper. They would need my airtime. So I ensured that I carried the airtime through. So that was my first business. The reason I started that business is because growing up, I believed my mother. And to some extent, my father, I realized men are less risk averse. My mother would come up with a business idea. And when she starts, my father would say, I will support you 
when they are still succeeding. That's what I'm saying. My mother was an entrepreneur. My father was a supporter of entrepreneurship. For the longest time, my mother believed that she can make some of business. The reason being, because we ran so many businesses at home when I was younger, that included a shop that would serve the villagers. My mother said, Gashali has a very good heart. It had a history to it. She has a very good heart. Anyone who walks around here looking like they are in need, she will give them things for free. And be very convinced that she's done the best there is to do and forget that this was a profit-making venture. That was me. I had done that before. When women would pass, when we have drought in my area where I come from, Paraka, they would have baskets and bags on their back looking for food. And I'd go to my mother's store and put all the grains that she got into their bags and tell them, go, God bless you, I'll be very happy. My mother would be very upset in the evening. So for that reason, my mother didn't believe I could be allowed at the shop. I said, no. Maybe leave her to do the portioning. There will be somebody else to pick the money. That is not the shop. She will give people things for free. So this for me, in retrospect, I realized, was an opportunity for me to actually get myself off the mindset of, I am too good, I will give for free. I had no option at this point. I couldn't give for free. I was the one in need. So I got pushed by the need to be able to at least raise money for myself for my full school fees, and I never went once with school fees balance, and for my own pocket money. So that was my first business. And then I thought, wow, now the money is multiplying. Everyone keeps asking for airtime, including the people sending around the university, will actually come for airtime for me on wholesale basis. So I thought, why not? Uh, do something different while keeping this. So because everyone will always stop me and ask, those earrings look very beautiful, why did you get them? That necklace looks very beautiful, why did you get it? I thought, wow, I'm going to choose these things for you, and I'll bring for you, and you pay me. And you pay me handsomely. And so I started what today is the name that we have used to date, Chef. Chef was my room in the university. That's what I call it. So, the first ever chef was chef jewel. And so people would buy from me. Yesterday I met someone who said, you know I still have the jewelry that I bought from you when you are still a student and it's just as when you sold it to me. And that expanded. And I started selling handbags. And I extended it to clothes. So, by the time I was in third year, what would happen is, I would, on a Friday, as my friends would leave class, and they go to watch movies because the week has beaten them proper in class. As they go to watch movies, I have booked an Akamba bus, ready to travel to Kampala, back from Kampala by Saturday evening, and have those products within my room in campus, and then I opened a shop in Mary, in Taraka, a place called Marimanti. I'd send them there and buy a motorbike and come from Haraka and be back in class Monday morning and seated in class like I don't know what you people were doing and you don't know what I was doing. We are both in class with <laughs> And I did that. And then the worst happened. Third year, I lost my mother. End of third year, just before my exams from third year. Now, I had four babies that nobody prepared me for. You know the one that you carry for nine months, you know it's coming. The one that you wake up and it's yours, you don't know what to do with it. So I had four babies. I had my sister who followed me, who now had a child. I had my brother, and I had my sister. My brother and sister were in class seven and in class eight. My brother was just remaining with about three weeks to sit for his case to be and he's lost a mother. So I somehow had to step up very fast. You realize when you're a firstborn, even the ones that are of age and have children, once they lose their mother, they 
pick your their mother and they, there is no other way around that. So you suddenly, suddenly have to just rise to the occasion. So I did that. And so besides just doing the businesses, what else I want to do? Is in the evening when I'm done with school, my, I thank God my parents had very good friends. And they were good friends to people. So their friends who were within Nairobi will get me teaching opportunities in their friends' houses. So there'll be children whose parents are privileged, they don't understand chemistry, they don't understand physics, they don't understand math, they don't understand biology. By good luck, when I finished Form 4, I'd been taken up by a high school in my um, rural area to teach as a non-trained teacher. So I had a bit of that history. So I certainly I would leave uh, the university in that evening. Um, this is Kenyatta Hospital. That's where the hostels are. This is third form. Uh, that year in fourth year. So I go to the stage uh, for Kenyatta, go into Gumo, take a matatu that comes from Gumo and crosses to South Bay. Then I'd finish and at 11 p.m. This route was my route. This one here next to Kenya. And then I'd go up the hill and be in the hostel. That was second year that I started doing that. So when I was in third year, it was easier because then I'd just come back into Kenyatta and I light at the state that I'm working. But that was it. When I finished in fourth year, I still ran my business for jewelry. When my mother passed on, she helped me a lot in managing the shop that was in the community. So what did I do? I closed it. And I closed it in a hurry because it wasn't a pleasant situation. My security was at risk, I needed to close it. So we closed it. And I went at a loss, complete loss. So I was listening to Mori and his chicken, and I said, those were my chicken. They died right there as I watched. So I came with the clothes, and the best I could do is there is a lady that um, I sold what I could. What I couldn't, I gave it to a lady who used to assist me in cleaning around the hostel to go and start a business. And so I finished the university. And those days, and like today, when you finished uh, medical school, you go straight into internship under the government. So we started internship at Kenyatta Hospital. I think when you are just an entrepreneur, once it gets into your blood, it's like becoming a politician. It's addictive. You just have to do it. So I'd still continue with my business in jewelry. And so what I will do. Now I formed a Facebook page. We called it Chef, uh, Chef um, House of Design. Eventually, my room in campus, by the time I crossed to the other side, we upgraded from Chef Jewel to Chef House of Design. Remember, I had clothes to sell. So, truly, we had designs. So, in Kenyatta Hospital, I will wake up very early in the morning, do deliveries for the orders that have been done online, um, and then go back to the hospital, serve patients, finish in the evening, and finish the rest of the deliveries. And also, I would ensure that I sell to um, the rest of the interns we are working with. They have money. They have been paid by the government. And our supervisors. I don't think there's anyone in Kenyatta who didn't know me because I sold them jewelry at one point of the year. <coughs> Then I thought, my schedule is too tight. Unlike everyone else who leaves Kenyatta and then goes home to rest, and then the schedule of being a dental intern is very crazy. So on a week that you're on call, you are the one who, you actually move from your house and you come to live in Kenyatta Hospital for a week. So I carry my suitcases and come live in Kenyatta Hospital in that week. You are the one who attends the outpatient clinic. You are the one who attends the emergency area. You are the one who is attending to the emergencies that go to the outpatient clinic as well. And the ones you're booking in emergency, you tell them to meet you in the outpatient in a day or two because you can't see all of them at the same time. You are the one in the wards preparing theater lists and ensuring that patients are taking their medication. And you're presenting those same patients to your supervisors and those supervisors don't realize that you're doing all these other work. They think the only thing that you're going to do is present to them. 
So they expect you to know everything. So you have to know everything. You still have to be in theater with them, assisting them as they do the surgeries. That's how dental interns are always fainting in theater. It's true. I did faint once. But that schedule is what I had to do. And on top of that, I had a business to run, which I took very seriously, by the way. So I decided one of the places that I was wasting a lot of time, and every time I walked in, I always had a solution, was in the salon. So I had straightened hair that had chemical on it. I'd always walk to the salon and tell them, do you have living treatment? I don't have time to wait. I can't sit here. Because I knew that would cut the process down to almost half. I realized it was getting irritating for the stylist. Every single time I'd come with the same story, I don't have time. And I thought, when I started seeing a few people spotting short hair like Rita there, I thought, wow, that looks good. In fact, it feels like being a man. You just need to get into a shower, and you shower from the top to the bottom, and you walk out. So I did that. One day I walked out of my house, by this time, um, post my internship, I'd gotten married. Um, one day I just walked out of the house in braids, like these ones, and in the evening I came back with hair that was less than an inch high. Of course, my husband looked at me and wondered the biggest one. But that was my start of the journey of keeping natural hair. What I wasn't prepared for, you know, I went to a village school. The lecturer here in general will tell you. In the village, as girls, when you go to school, you don't keep hair. Of course, there will be politics around it, and the half of that used to be competing with the teacher. So I kept short hair. <laughs> I kept short hair. And then I went to boarding school in class five. My mother thought, let me make work easier for this child. So I'll relax her hair, and then it should become straight. And so when she puts a comb, it just goes through. Mothers just have solutions, don't they? So my mother requested a few teachers to allow me to grow my hair the last time of school, because they were her friends from the teacher as well. So when I go to school, we relax it, and it becomes um, straight. So I had never, for the life of me, interacted with my natural hair. Never. Besides it being short. So now I have cut it, but I have started growing. I don't know what to do with it. I remember once I'm going to a salon here at Tindara. Do you guys know where these salons at Tindara are? Yes, just here at Fitri. So I went to a salon there. And I just told them, do for me blow dry. Then we do condoms. And they put in the blow dryer and it will come off. The comb will come off. Why? Because it can't go through the comb. It's through the hair. It's too tough. And they just told me, just go back with your money. <laughs> so I wondered, okay. So what is the problem? So I decided I'm going to ask a few friends. I asked one of my friends who had long natural hair what she does. She told me a few things, then told me I'll put it in a group on Facebook that discusses how to deal with natural hair. So she put me in a group or two, and I learned. I read so much about hair and how to take care of my natural hair. I would go around shopping. The one thing I realized when we were shopping for those products is you spend an arm, a leg, your kidney and then the spleen on that hair. You'd shop one product, and the least you would spend on that product would be 2,500 shillings. And that's one product. And then so you need a shampoo, you need a conditioner, you need, what else, ladies? You need, you need a leave-in, what else do you need? You need a moisturizer, what else do you need? Your oils. So you can imagine each one of those products is 2,500. How much are you going to spend? 
Yes. And then you don't know what's happening. You are experimenting. And there are all these people talking to you, telling you this is how to do it, this is how to do it. So you end up with taking your ghost book. And if you look at what you have spent there, it is a lot. But one day, change my back, back bench sitting. On one of those groups that I was in on Facebook, somebody said, ladies, I have just seen virgin coconut oil at Uchumi Agakano. I was working in a private clinic at um, the building next door, the KCB building. I said, ah, Agakano is just here. I walk there over lunchtime. So I continue seeing my patients. Then over lunchtime, I strolled to Chumi and the camp. I didn't find a single bottle of virgin coconut oil. I'll tell you why they needed virgin coconut oil. And that's the reason why I took this journey. I realized when I was in the natural community trying to learn about her, the natural community was yes about beauty, but it was more a conversation about her, not about beauty. Because what they believed was what you can eat or drink is safe enough to put on your hair and on your skin. The reason why that was the catchphrase they used was because most of the products that they used and that we've used, and the reason why my hair that day put cold, are not made for us as Africans. They are not even made with African cosmetology in mind. They are made with Caucasian cosmetology, but for the African market. So the only way you can deal with your hair is by making it straight like a Caucasian's hair for you to deal with it. Once it becomes this tiny thing that I'm carrying on my head, or what she's carrying on her head, they don't know how to deal with it. And the only way to do that is to put very many chemicals inside. Most of which are very harmful to your health. I don't know if any of you has had a relaxer done and you want to stop. Yeah? It's chemical one we need. It's not fire. Okay? So those are the chemicals you are dealing with. And so the reason why women left their job stations in Nairobi to run and go to Uchumi and Gatanwok, you wonder where they were working. So the reason why this will be what they thought is because they needed to be able to see products that responded to their own African hair. Those products will be available, the few of them that would come would be available from the US, US or the UK because that's where people started talking about healthy um, cosmetics. So that's why we would be paying 2500 for that to be made from there. So I thought, we have the ingredients here, but we're paying so much for them. But on top of that, women are not concentrating at work because they need products. When they hear there's a product somewhere, they run for it. At that point, it's not like today when you walk around and you find natural products everywhere. Someone would have to have traveled to the US or the UK and come back with a suitcase full of products and sold to their friends. If you're not their friend, you have no products. So that was what I was responding to. And from that day, Shat Naturals was born from that. I told myself I was at least going to begin from what was the easiest thing to do. Avail the oils for the market, at least for women to stop running from their workplaces into shops. And so the one thing I had was social media. And so we started our business on social media. 
I pack my products from my son's bedroom. And then I will ensure that I deliver them. I was still the accountant. I was also the one administering the office just in case you call to us who Chef Naturals is. And I do all that work, sales, marketing, and everything. And then at some point, I managed to bring on board two um, workers, one to assist me with deliveries, because we were operating on social media, and the other one to assist me with the actual social media work. And that's where we began. From there, we found ourselves in a one-bedroom house, because there's no way we are going to be able to afford anything more. In a residential place, because you cannot afford to be where people are having industries. Then we moved to a three bedroom. Then we found ourselves in a five bedroom. At this point, our clients had taken so much trust in our products and in our care for what they were doing. They requested, please, would you consider, instead of just giving us oils, also give us the shampoos that we have to get from the UK and the US. And that is how our second brand, Sheba, was formed. And so in 2017, we started at the QD um, facilities in South Bay. 2018, our capacity could fit at Kirby. We moved, I asked one of my people to assist me, and we looked for a very small room, somewhere in industry area that could only accommodate the production. So we moved there. And then thereafter, we thought the five bedroom could no longer continue. So we had to look for space next to where we had started. And that's how in 2019, we ended up in industry area. I am giving this story just so that I paint for you what real entrepreneurship from the ground up looks like. I'm glad Rita has narrated what it looks like to join a company that's already formed. Then there is the bait. So you have to deal with the ground up. Okay, great. My best definition of an entrepreneur from where I stand is someone who is self assured and self doubt. Because along that journey, you will doubt yourself a lot. I tell you, the instance for me that was the most challenging and the one I doubted myself the most was the moment I had to quit my dentistry completely and move into being an entrepreneur full time. I actually did not tell my family. I went to Maragua, I resigned, I came back, and they saw me every day at the office, and they didn't understand what I was doing. They assumed I was on leave. And then one day I called them for prayers at the office. And my father-in-law asked me, I'm sure this can pay you. <laughs> I always laugh at him because even the shelf of books I had, he asked me, I like the way uh, Tukun is pronounced. My toe, my toe is my mom. No, my mom. But if you always stay here or you ask for it to come today, then you will return it where it belongs. That was a point of self-doubt. But you can never survive in business without both self-doubt and self-assuredness. And I like to call it self-belief as well. Give me the next slide. What are the pull factors that sent me to open Chef Naturals? Like I have said, I saw a need. People needed healthy products. They were not available. We needed to fill that gap. It was a personal gap as well. But besides that, I realized that I was also um, speaking to health at a public um, level because you realize a lot of the uh, children nowadays will be born with issues like eczema and such kind and we ended up having to deal with that. So we did end up 
just where we started. The road has taken different other roads from there. So just showing you how our business looked like at the beginning, that those were our products. This was our Sheba brand when we started. That's where we have rebranded to. That used to be our initial logo. The current logo is the one that's very clear there. This is the first training we ever had for our staff. Um, they were just two of them. This is our current shop now, on Moy Avenue. That used to be our small factory when we started. We had no equipment whatsoever. That's our factory today. Please take me to the next slide. Thank you. These are the highs and lows of what operating a real business looks like. I have pointed to our first office and where we did our first training. This was on a day that we launched our first actual manufactured product. That there, that was at the Intercontinental Hotel. We were launching our Sheba brand, which we manufacture ourselves. And that there is still our second office. This was the first time we appeared on anybody's newspaper. That was in 2017 as we launched our Sheba brand. And those there are the people that were in attendance with us. Maureen today is uh, working for L'Oreal at the Paris office. She was one of our board members when we started. That there, I would like Bokeh to show us castor, black castor oil. That there was the day that we were launching it for the first, we were launching the first time. That's after we have uh, rebranded to the new brand. Give me the next slide. So, this one. yes, that's how it looks today. That was a previous image. This was what I was, and this is what you expect to be as a body entrepreneur. You be the one that doing the administration, doing the accounting work and ensuring that the math is working, doing the marketing job, doing the sales uh, job, doing the deliveries and coming the communication plan. So, so really, like Rita says, you will be the one to arrive first in your business, the last to leave in the evening. These are some of the times that we found ourselves in events. This was in Nakuru. We were trying to uh, teach people uh, what it is to be a natural. These are other events that we have done. Uh, and this was our team that we were working with at that point. Give me a next slide. And so, I have talked about the vision. But then the point about the vision is, it does not always end up the way you saw it at the beginning. Yes, there is the basic, the core of the vision. For us, it was to offer affordable products to the market. But with time, that has deviated. What we started with as just repackaging, we found ourselves in manufacturing proper, which I never thought for the life of me would happen. I found myself at a point where I've had to make a decision to quit my job as a dentist to just do this purely. I found myself at a place where we've had to revise what kind of packaging we are doing and add more products to our product line and attend to more markets than we thought we could. Find ourselves opening shops which we never thought we could. That is what it is to find yourself on a journey that keeps turning. So the one thing you have to keep in mind is to be alert. At what point does an opportunity present itself? And at what point do you take it on? Otherwise, if you're not alert, if you're not attentive to the needs of the market, you end up getting caught up and becoming irrelevant to the market. And so basically, I know we watch entrepreneurs and you pick that favorite one and you say, this one, I like their story. And you want to deal with that story. And you think the way their journey has been, is how your journey is going to be. can never be the same. So just know, even if you operated the same business in the same space of natural hair and skincare products like we do, it will never be the same. The traditional app does not apply to you. So, like I said, it is not a linear journey for any one person. Innovation what we are here to talk about. I want to believe that I have spoken about it in my uh, story, in terms of process, in terms of product. But also the one question and challenge I want to leave you with is this. 
are entrepreneurs who are innovating. Is it inherent in them? Or there is something that is in the market, and so you find the need and just identify it. To come up with the need, and so come up with the market as well and decide this is innovation, or is there a market that is existent and you look for an, um, the solution and you give it to the market? What is innovation? I'd like to leave that to you. So that's our factory. Those are our people working. What are the highs, what are the lows that we have experienced? The highs, I have talked about them. Um, I'd like to talk about the lows, but really I wouldn't consider them as lows. Just the challenges of business. Business in this country is heavy. And if you are not built for it, you will give up very fast. One, the regulatory framework is very bad in some. And then you need capital to think about. You need to think about the different licenses to operate the business. You need to think about the child issues because we find ourselves in a dispensation where the older generation that believe very seriously in hard work is very different from the current generation that we're dealing with. So we have to keep evolving and figuring out how to handle different generations depending on how they have been exposed in terms of where they're going. Next, so the one thing I must leave you with is to stay assured and positive about entrepreneurship. It works and there will never be a better journey that you will take. I will be willing to take two um, members of the entrepreneurship class under my guidance um, to see where we go with this journey. So, um, to the team that leads the entrepreneurship class, um, I'll be glad to receive the names once it is decided on. Thank you. Wow. More applause, please. That was a great one. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sure you have enjoyed a lot. Oh, thank you. I share your link here. You require a whole lot of This story is lovely and very sweet. Welcome our guest, uh, Rita. And uh, I can share it, please uh, have a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, I didn't want to waste any time. I know, uh, Rita, let me apologize. You know, we are saying we are living earlier. But sorry for keeping you, you know. The shape of our CEO, we understand. We know. But uh, it is. We are So here we are. So, see, we are. We are. We are. We are. We are. As I told you, if you charge you, you will be surprised. So, ladies and gentlemen, without wasting any time, I will be going straight to the questions and I will be taking about six questions at most. So kindly be very quick, should you add up, so that you can be able to ask your question, then uh, direct it specifically, direct it specifically to a specific uh, speaker, and that will, I, I want us to take all the questions first, so that we save our time. I'm giving this 10 minutes maximum to 15 minutes, because as I told you, they had commitments, this is the, these are corporates. They are not they are not government employees. They are not politicians. Politicians are the ones who have all the time. So these ones are busy. So I will be taking that, but before I take it, I will draw one to Rita. What do we do to change the mindset of the young guys who are always looking for deals? Deals. You got like a deal. You know, is entrepreneurship still about deals? You know, I need to be a Rufutano, who never did that. Kameva. Is it a good Is it a good approach? You can deal with Eva. I ought to understand that. I can deal with Eva, you know. Sayina or Sayina in the Choma. I don't know. Anyway, so, ladies and gentlemen, let me have the hands, please. 
Like you come, come, come along, please. Come, just feel free to come. This is how you train to be leaders. Just come forward, don't fear. Let me have, please. Let me have. Kindly, come, come. Just stand here, don't worry. Stand here. Come, come. This side, I need you here. Okay. There's another lady coming there, thank you. This side, I need one more. One more, thank you. Those are for now, oh, these are gentlemen only. Ladies, where are you? These are our ladies. I didn't bring in a man as a speaker. And the men are always coming to ask questions. Where are you? Yeah, you have a lot of mentorship to do. And uh, <laughs> they can share. Uh, ladies, come on. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. One more, lady. One more. One more. Just one. So that we may move. Just one. Just one. Ah. I need one to know what Okay, let me start with the uh, those are here. Thank you. There is a mic there, and you have uh, you can ask a question if it is one or two directed to a specific uh, speaker, and then you should pick. As uh, you pick, not he or she, but she. Thank you. Let's take it fast. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Emmanuel Bitonga. Uh, I tend to have a common interest with the latest speaker. The latest speaking has just come from that. I tend to have the same interest in. Uh, uh, products, like, specifically for yes, sir, so yeah. I'd like to ask, uh, how did you go about the funding issue? Because I've been thinking about it, and uh, in my interest to begin such a, a, a product, I've had a problem with figuring out how I'm going to, to source scanning uh, equipment. So I'd like you to kindly share that, and also. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I'm not part of the entrepreneurship uh, group, but I'd like to request that you, as you take the two, that you add me. Add me. Yeah. Yeah. Rita Lizema Lazima Oza Mayai Kwanza. Hey! 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 Let's move this side. Don't, don't go. Uh, just move this side so that I... Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kenneth Mashiro. I'm a student for the entrepreneurship class. A business consultant. My question is to Rita. What is the gap that you have realized in equipment in the business department? Like, as business students, we are trying to figure out what the market is looking for. For me, I'm a procurement student. So, because of, in, like your company, you do, you build your own, your own systems. You are looking for other procurement students. Am I of value for you, or do I have to start my own capacity? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, after you are done, you can have a seat so that the one who is speaking can study where he is. Do you want to come here on the camera? Who comes to the Someone is calling me from Germany, and I need to see. In effect, because of the speakers, that speaker. Um, my name is Greg Mamaya, and I'm a student for Consumers Class. So my question is to Madam Leader. I just wanted to ask her, what makes uh, uh, Isuzu ahead of other dealerships in town, and what makes it special over other dealerships in town? Uh, what services do they offer ahead of other dealerships? And the second question is, um, is it okay for one to feel satisfied if, let's say, one is in your position? Uh, heading at a very big company like that. Um, is it okay for one to feel satisfied? Or it is good for someone to go ahead and uh, look for greater pastors somewhere else? Thank you. Can, can you try and come up here so that the, the mic is far from the speaker? Yes, that one. There is okay. So that the mic is far from the speaker. Thank you. Hello, good. Afternoon, everyone. My name is Rana Wangare. It's okay, continue. The chairperson of the Entrepreneurship Club, and I'm glad to be here. So, my question goes to Dr. Kashemi. 
why would I choose to purchase a product or set and not any other product? And uh, the second question is, as you are starting up your business, do you have any partners? And is it safe to start partnership when your business is still young? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Let's move fast. Thank you so much. They are noting. Yeah, we can. Okay, um, I'm a Dio Adil Karan, and I'm a student of IR. Um, my question is on, uh, uh, it's about, uh, as you people transport uh, a lot of things using this card, uh, what, are, what are you guys doing as Isuzu? to limit air pollution and arrest climate change and global warming. Think that global, think, think that global warming is an issue to all of us and it's a worldwide issue to everyone. Uh, recently, uh, I'll just add on something little. Uh, there's something about the Nile water that uh, is happening in South Sudan, as you see. And it's all about drinking of the Nile water, uh, the Nile River. So uh, the issue has been stopped recently simply because of environmental issues. So I am asking the same, same thing here, but it's nothing to do with the Nile water. It's everything to do with the transportation. So what are you guys doing about the global warming? Yes. Thank you, thank you, yes. Thank you. Proceed. Good afternoon, everyone. So my question is to Madam Rita. Um, you didn't have any experience in um, the industry you joined. What actually inspired you to join that industry? Because currently I am a student of international relations, and my I, I like houses. I like uh, real estate. So I'm like. Should I join or should I not join? So I am scared because this is something I don't know, and uh, I'd like to know what inspired you to just try. It. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can. Uh, let's take a recap. Uh, you have. Uh, you must better music. Pastor. So it could be great. Um, thank you, Sean. I have a question to to Rita. According to transportation. As you all know that uh, we are evolving, we are going to electrical means. Uh, what, what is your take? Like, what, what is your plan? And uh, do you think uh, moving electrical can also affect your business in the future? Thank you. Let me start with the Rita who will handle my question first. The deals. <laughs> I'll take the deals last. <laughs> <laughs> So let, let, me, let me quickly go through from Sean eh, around the transportation and how tech is going to disrupt uh, the transportation sector. So true, the world is moving towards greener uh, propulsion, mobility, and um, it will start with the cars, the saloon vehicles, already there's electrification, use of natural gas, uh, you know, you can power your, your vehicle. For our region, infrastructure has to come first for you to be able to get the gas, to power your engine and all that. So the motor vehicle, uh, saloon vehicles and station wagons will move first towards electrification. Today you can import your electrical vehicle and you can use it. It's cheaper to run, it's more efficient, less in terms of maintenance costs. So the globe is going to transition to electrification for use of greener energy. When it comes to commercial vehicles, uh, they need a, a bigger battery that has got the capacity to hold 400, 500 kilometer transportation. So that is, those are the studies that are happening today. So different markets adopt technology differently. The Europeans have already started. I think by the year 2023, 20, some countries in Europe, you cannot operate like diesel engine. You have to go complete to uh, electrical vehicles, electrical even trucks. 
So Europe will start first. The Japanese, where my production comes from, have already started to develop electrical trucks. And the key challenge for electrical trucks is, as I've said, the battery life. How can we increase the battery life to be able to move from one area to another? Now, young startups like you are already in Kenya and they're converting like land cruisers and all these vehicles that take tourists and back and fro to electrical vehicles. They are actually in industrial area. Those who are interested in engineering, you can visit them and see. So for larger trucks out of Japan, we think uh, we will be testing our technology in like America in the year 2025. Then from that time, we should then be able to build the infrastructure in our country. The powering of vehicle infrastructure has to be in place before you can actually bring electrical trucks. So we are in the process of uh, development, product development. Coming to the question uh, on um, the environment and our responsibility around the environment, the motor vehicle being one of the major pollutants of the environment, for Kenya, for instance, we are transitioning actually from January 1st next year, we are transitioning to Euro 4 on commercial vehicles. What Euro definition really means is that you are discharging the exhaust fumes are much more cleaner from lower Euro to higher Euro. You can start from Euro 0, Euro 1, Euro 2, Euro 3, Euro 4 and on. But because we are importing our fuel today, our imported fuel is very clean. And therefore, it can be used to power your truck. So Kenya is transitioning, actually it's the first in, 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 in the whole of Africa to transition to more green from Euro uh, 2 now to Euro 4, effective 1st of January. So even your personal car that you will be importing from Japan when you start working, it has to be Euro 4. So that is to, for green. But also there's a lot of NEMA work. A company like mine cleans its water. We clean our water before we discharge our water into the environment today. All water is clean, you can use it from our factory. So that's part of the greening initiative from a corporate social responsibility point of view. We are planting trees, we are doing everything we can to go green. But from a regulatory standpoint, the transitioning is already there. When we get the charging opportunity, then we will then move to electrical vehicles, maybe in the year 2030, 2035. Okay? Can I take all my questions? Yeah, 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 okay. Okay. Um, if an employee is working for us, a very organization that is doing very well, should that employee seek uh, new alternatives, I mean new opportunities? Yes, we live in a world of opportunities. Uh, if an employee finds it fit for them to stay with us in our company, for sure we welcome that, we develop them, we give them challenging experience so that they can really learn and grow. But if an employee finds new opportunity, which will make them even grow more, we support that because we are in the business of helping people to uh, actualize their full potential. Whether they are working with us or through working with us, we have developed them to take their next big job, we bless them so they can be able to continue to grow. So our company is not the company that restricts. It, it gives people wings so they can continue to fly. So you could, uh, you could exit. What makes our business special? Uh, sheer hard work. So first we have safe and great products that bring value to our customers. When a customer buys, when Kevin buys the school bus, I believe the school bus of either the church or the school has been with the school for over 20 years. That we can assure you. So we, we make great products that give great value to our customers. Our execution, 
is next to none. We hire extremely intelligent, I'm going to question one, what does it take for you to work for us? We hire very, very competent people. You must be a second class upper or a first class owner's person. And we change our hiring model. We hire uh, and we train. So you finish your degree, you have got a first class or a very powerful upper second, we take you. We take you for one year, we pay you very well. But you're on training. You can make a decision, we can make a decision whether we employ you, you also can make a decision during that one year of training on whether to stay with us or you can get another job and go. What do we do in the one year with you? We make sure we expose you to all our businesses. Whether it's marketing, sales, purchasing, distribution, manufacturing, and all that. We develop you as an individual. In the meantime, we are looking for fit. Who has got those entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial skills? Who has got the right culture, the right attitude, the right work ethic? Who amongst you is resilient enough to navigate the challenges of modern day place of work? Then we take you. The other one, if they are not able to fit in, we will release them, but they will be able to fit somewhere else very, very well. But we keep the very best. I think I've answered all my questions. Anyone have not answered your question? Around? Oh, my darling, that's the best. Oh, yeah. So what inspired me to join, it was, um, of course, I was looking for a job. <laughs> money, uh, money, 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 money. I had just finished university. I had done um, a small job in a software development company. And I needed to work. I had my son. I needed to work in a company that assured me of job security. The company where I was working was for Gasheri's type of company. It was a startup. So we were struggling. And uh, I was not ready to stay long, to struggle with it. So I needed to be able to secure my son, to be able to pay school fees, to be in an institution that I thought would help me to grow. So that's why I ended up in that organization. But because I had a need, I really put in the effort. Remember, you have to, when you start a business, you have to see what gap you're trying to plug. I was plugging a personal gap. And it made me put the effort. So don't shy away. Go, go and do that housing stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anita, for that response. Someone, a student is whispering to me here. Can I get an attachment there? This far, can you answer that before I sanitize? Can I get an attachment at the Zuzu? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, and for those who are looking for deals or this big deals, we, is it a business that will grow? Like a business? Are you uh, after short term type of business or you want to build an enterprise that? We have a story like the story we have seen today. So there is no there is no problem with short term business and long term business. It's does it do you feel happy? Thank you so much. Let us uh, take now uh, share the naturals and then uh, from there we'll just be left with the bottom lines. Please stay calm and uh, we almost have it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, let us uh, just uh, cut it short a little. As I told you, it was really rest. So we want to release, we want to release uh, 
Return it and kindly come here so that uh, we can be able to appreciate you so that everybody knows you are in Kemo. Principal, come along. Dean, come along. Kashiri, come along. Come along. We will just uh, please come along. Come along. Yeah, can they keep his the camera? Uh, no, it uh, the camera. The principal, I think the camera is on this side, the one which is online, so that we can be able to at least. They uh, can't go out. <laughs> uh, thank you. What is it? Uh, remove it, just unpack it. Unpack it. So that you don't say Rita was given a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate. Thank you so much. Asante sana. Let's have for uh, for share the list. Let's uh, let's have it so that we all have it together. Yeah, then we will be complete. Kindly, let's do that. So, kindly students, na juu mesi ya jaa, lakini nuki angali ya pale nyuma niko na kakitu. So, don't leave. Where is the camera? Thank you. Uh, Professor Wanja, prepare to give a vote of thanks immediately after this. And you come for the photo. Where is bro? Kindly, can you stand here for the photo? Wait, yeah, no, I will, I will do that so that uh, I wanted it to be. So I will do that. Uh, Professor Wanja, please uh, come along, give us a vote of thanks so that we release her. I do not want her to go before she hears from us. Kindly. Uh, you bear with me. I'm trying to manage time. Sorry for that. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Professor Wanja from Wilberton and Bergen. I don't think you would have been a better place than here. Maybe if I had listened to our two speakers, I'd also have become an entrepreneur. <laughs> But uh, I guess we're just at the right place and the right time. It's never the wrong time. It's never too late. Uh, I really want to thank you, our two speakers, for really giving us an insight. How, when I look at uh, the two of you, where you have come from, from help, from being a teacher and really facing it. The few things that I've taken from this talk today is that you need to, be, to believe in yourself. You need to be focused and to stay on course. I'm sure they have not told us the, the laws. You have really painted a nice picture, but I'm sure you've had a few laws, but staying on course really makes sure that uh, you make it. We really, really want to thank you for taking your time. We know you're busy and for really uh, being here and uh, giving us those insights. For us who are grown up, for the students, you have it. Now you had. Take your time, volunteer, stay on course, and you will make it. There is, there is nothing that you cannot do as long as you have, you have your mindset. And they have told it to you. We have always told you, but maybe hearing it from the industry and volunteering, the small things that you do, for that some of you who are my students have only said, small things that you do will make a difference. Grow your CV, listen to these kind of talks, they will take you far. I want to thank the management uh, from the principal for uh, giving us the opportunity for organizing this uh, great event. I thank the entrepreneur uh, club, uh, Eric, for really being there, motivating the students, organizing it. Thank you so much for that. The dean for pushing through, the faculty for being here, uh, walking through with the students. I want to thank you, the students, for showing up, because if you never showed up, then the talk would not have been complete. 
Our technical team, thank you for being there, for showing us and for making sure that we are online, we are connected. And uh, the bishop, for the prayers, we thank God that we are healthy and we have remained healthy. And we've heard that even during hard times, that you can take an opportunity. We had it from Rita that she made more money during COVID than she had made it before. So every opportunity comes. We thank God that we have remained healthy. For Kemo, the future is here, and you know you can have it all. Thank you so much, and uh, may God bless you as we listen to the last bit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me go to the next. Can you don't, don't even try that. Let's uh, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Tari. Uh, kindly just uh, handle a few questions. Then uh, I want to release the Rita because of that. Uh, kindly, can you have a seat, please? Before I exercise my powers. Anyway, <laughs> not a threat. Thank you. So I had two questions. Uh, the first one was on packaging for um, hair products. Now, the starting point is to decide what kind of products you're making, what kind of market you are addressing. You need to decide whether you're going into the mass market, because if you're going to the mass market, that dictates um, the level of product packaging that you're going to be dealing with. If you're taking on a niche product or a niche market, then you need to be able to attend to the needs of the, uh, that niche market using your packaging as well. Products are not as straightforward as just you have a product, you put it in a package, and it goes out into the market. You really need to think about your uh, the person that you are targeting with the product. So then once you have decided that, you decide uh, it's the mass market that I can be able to actually just start off with packaging that is made locally and which is much cheaper. And so usually it will be so much easier to uh, access that because uh, we have many companies that will be doing uh, the packaging uh, locally. There's General Plastics, there's uh, Safe Pack. Um, there are quite a number of companies also that have come up with time except for those two uh, very large ones. So you can always be able to get packaging for mass market. If you are thinking uh, packaging for the niche market, there are certain people that are now, when we were starting, we were not there. They have now been observing the market and saying there are a lot of people that are coming up with niche products. And so they import for you uh, the packaging and you're able to buy it from here. But it is very uh, high level packaging. So the only challenge with that is it's a bit pricey, so obviously you transfer it to uh, your client. And so because it is a niche product you're dealing with and it's a premium product, and you're able to carry that burden to the client, the reason being you are not dealing with a very price-sensitive market. Um, then maybe um, the other way to look at it is you are starting off uh, you need to be able to see whether the client is the same that you are dealing with. I did not have a talk like this to assist me figure out about my packaging. When I was ready, I just started. So you've seen the kind of packaging we started with and even the kind of branding that we started with. Eventually, we were at a place where we could be able to even approach someone to be able to assist us figure out how to make this a global brand, a product that you can find in the UK and buy without thinking, hmm, looks a bit substandard. So yes, we did start with what was available locally, but with time we were able to meet the uh, minimum order quantities to be able to import all our packaging. So currently all our packaging is imported. Um, because also locally you may not be able to get something that you need um, for your specific client. So it's both sides. Where are you starting from? And also looking at the type of market that you're going to be addressing. Um, I want to handle the second question. Why would anyone want to purchase a shirt product and not any other product? Number one, um, in terms of our vision, we are very focused on safety and high quality. The point I left dentistry is because I realized, like I said, this was not a conversation about beauty. It was a conversation about health. The reason why we are having, and I always repeat this story, 
because it is the reason why I was actually pushed into this trade. A girl called Gasheri, like myself, had a cancer um, in Kenyatta National Hospital. I tried to assist her overnight to get admitted. And at the end of the day, we got to the ward and we were told, you cannot admit her. She has stage four cancer. You cannot really release her to go home and die. In about three weeks, she came from my village, she died. So one of the things I asked myself at that point is, how can we be able to intercept and prevent these diseases without them having to come to this point? Yeah. So because at the level of me offering free medical camps in Tarakanidi, I was able to intercept the diseases at the point of curative. You've come with a disease, you had not gone to a hospital, we can be able to catch it in good time before it becomes too serious and it's not at the level where Nasheri's disease was at and she has to just take a few weeks to die. So at this point I was wondering, how is it that you can actually prevent the diseases? Like it or not, some of the things that we pick from cosmetic products actually have an impact on your health at the end of the day. So you realize in your reading, and that's one of the reasons that when I went into research, I decided to share natural, and so when you look at our products, you realize it is free of this, free of the other, free of this other one, free of... So it's free of anything that would be harmful to the human health in the short term or in the long term. So basically, how we operate shed is literally like a hospital. Even when you walk into our um, manufacturing um, space, it's clean enough for you to drop food here and eat it. Yeah? We operate like the way you walk into a theater. Because we believe that um, when you are taught about medicine and how you get diseases, there are accumulative factors. It's usually not one factor. So maybe it could be genetics, uh, you could be probably smoking, it could be alcohol here or there, it could be uh, you have consistent trauma in an area that predisposes you to a disease or, uh, or another. But there is a part of what you are using consistently over time. And that cumulative effect actually affects you with time. So you realize for things like you're talking about breast cancer, you're talking about uh, cervical cancer, some of these chemicals that come from cosmetics have actually been found to be tissues that, um, uh, that, that, that uh, are cancerous. So we call them uh, carcinogenic product, uh, ingredients. So we avoid anything that is literature of whatever nature will even be remotely associated with causing disease. Now, one of the things that we are fighting very strongly about currently is what we call greenwashing. Um, and greenwashing just basically means, um, I have realized that the market wants products that are clean, products that assure them that their health is okay, Products that are sure, they like uh, the lady from South Sudan who has asked about the environment. Products that also protect the environment. Because you can imagine, if that product is harmful to you, when you throw it into a river, it is going to do the same exact thing to the aquatic um, animals and all that that you have as population in the water. So you really need to protect that. But because sometimes we get unscrupulous as manufacturers, a lot of people are coming up and say, my product is organic, my product is natural, my product is this or the other, and they've tested it against nothing. So one of the things I am currently very seriously fighting about is the standardization of natural products, because it doesn't exist in Kenya. People just wake up and come up with a brand and throw it into the market. Most of those are not even regulated by Kenya uh, Bureau of Standards. So that would be the difference between the product you find on the shelf and the next other product. And we run that as the way we would run a clinic, basically. So we realize a lot of people come from hospitals and they are going to us uh, to sort out things. Partnerships in business, um, will, will they consider a partnership? Not at the moment. And uh, the second bit of that question was uh, whether there is, um, it is wise for us to take on partners at an early stage the one thing that you do a lot when a business is young is you put in a lot of time. Yes, there is a resource in terms of money that you put in, but I can tell you you can't quantify your time and even start to um, put a value to it. It is a very expensive affair. Currently, I'm still alone. We've just completed eight years of being in existence as a business. Obviously, I'm looking forward to the day that we say 
like Isuzu that we have celebrated 140 years. But I can tell you, if I decide to sell right now, I'll sell cheap. So I am not willing to sell. The reason being no one will consider my time because it probably doesn't show in the business because the business has not gotten to the level of giving such turnovers. But at that point where you're able to give that, those turnovers, they're willing to look into what else you've put into the business. I consider my time as the most, um, uh, the greatest resource that I have put into my business, much more than the money I have put into it. I still want to address the issue of deals. I know it was um, thrown at Madame Rita. Yes, it's okay. Let's see. Um, unfortunately, and uh, I'd, uh, I, I, I find this as a very um, not nice way of how we have handled ourselves as a country and probably the world in terms of leadership. I don't think the young generation just woke up and decided we are a deals generation. It's what they have seen us do. They wake up one day and someone got into leadership and they suddenly catch deals and they are suddenly very rich. Someone got into this place or the other. So the one thing I have consistently said, there is great need for all of us to cultivate doing the right thing in every position that we are put in. The young generation will pick it from us. But because the young generation is here with me today, I will tell you one thing. The times that I have done the right thing, it felt better than the many times that I either lied or tried to take a shortcut. It makes you sleep better at night, knowing there is nobody whose child is in hospital because you took a shortcut with your life or you took a shortcut um, with trying to go around things. I imagine like people who get into business quickly, probably just giving the example of a cosmetic business, because you want the profits, you put in chemicals that are harmful to people just so that you can make quick money and because the ingredient is a cheaper ingredient than the other. And then that person with time will actually pass on and all that struggle. Not every day, they, they may not mention your name, but at the end of the day, you didn't do the right thing. And you know for sure it's cost someone a life somewhere. Doing the right thing will always make you sleep better at night. Uh, Willie Mutunga the other day, uh, the CJ, as he was standing 75, he was asked uh, the re how he has managed to look so young. And he said, um, out of the other reasons of keep fit, um, eat well, he said, don't have too much money. Well, the only thing he was basically trying to say is, you may try to lose, to gain the whole one and lose your soul at it. So please don't gain the whole one at the expense of doing the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. Don't, don't move. Don't move. Something has come up. Somebody has asked which job is most stressing between dentistry and uh, the one you are doing now. <laughs> which one? Uh, have you fainted in this one? Any one time? <laughs> Um, I'll tell you, entrepreneurship is much more stressful than dentistry, by far. I think I struggled in dentistry a lot when I was a student and when I was doing my internship. The rest of the party were enjoying just cutting teeth and ensuring that people's jewels go back to their normal position when they dislocate. In business, no one tells you what is coming tomorrow. And for that reason, I am a person who gets bored very easily. Dentistry tends to be very um, repeaters. Every other process is basically the same today. I did this type of a canal tomorrow. I saw this other one. It's literally the same job throughout. In business, things are different and the challenges are different. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Rita, tell us that last you have something for everybody here, isn't it? I'm told this is something for everyone. Yes. Me included. <laughs> Although I have no hair. <laughs> if I'm only included too. <laughs> oh, Sherry, Sherry, no, 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 sorry, sorry. Yes, okay. um, so yes, we ensured that we carried a sample for each one of you to be able to sample what Chef Naturals does. A clap for that, please. <laughs> yeah. So 
So we carried in a small shampoo. Um, we were talking innovation today. So what our shampoo is, is actually a shampoo bar. That's why I'm calling it small, as opposed to little. Because if it's liquid, then it's little. So it's a small piece for you to be able to see how shampoo bars work. And the reason why we put it into a bar, number one was obviously being able to protect the environment in terms of having to throw away too much of plastics into it and we also take back our packaging. The other reason why we made it into a bar is so that it can contain so many ingredients that are good for African hair. Then we have a deep conditioner. Uh, a deep conditioner is a treatment. So some of you will get the deep conditioner, others will get um, uh, the shampoo bar. The deep conditioner just basically contains protein and moisture, which is what your hair is made of. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gasheri. A big applause, please. You have taken so much time. Thank you. I can now allow you to take your seat. As you take your seat, please, if you have any time, uh, uh, kindly those who do want to do personal consultation, for two five minutes as you move away, as you go out, then we will appreciate. The, this, the student, uh, she has offered two. So, uonge na hili kisijika utaonge na hili vizuri ya mutafanya vizuri kwa kati. You love to, to look for a way. Hata kama ni exam, apatia wa wili. So, let me welcome uh, uh, Mary Dabari to pray for us as we conclude. And we can do that while studying. And before that, before we pray, I think uh, there is uh, some refreshment. Somebody will be organizing. Who was that, Jeff? Nani uh, So that uh, we can have a direction. Is that someone? Eric, who is uh, on eating that? Somebody will be there to give you the soda. Now you pick up yourself after you feel that Kawana is a premium uh, initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gashe. So let us uh, pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Indeed, we honor you, King of Kings. We we thank you for such an opportunity, oh God. Indeed, uh, you, your word says we keep growing in knowledge, Father. And we thank you for today our hearts are filled, oh God. Our minds have been expanded, King of Kings. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together as uh, your children, Father, and for the inspiration, dear God. We thank you for our guests, Father. We ask that you bless the work of their hands, that you continue to expand them, dear Lord. We also want to just thank you for Kemo and the friend that what we stand for, Father. For indeed, we have seen you. We have seen you work through us, Jehovah God, even as we nurture these dear, uh, young ones, Father God, as they move forward in the journey of life, Father, as they start off in education, Father, and continue towards their entrepreneurial journey and even towards employment, dear God. We thank you. We thank you for what you have poured into our hearts this afternoon. And uh, Lord, as we depart, we ask that you bless our, uh, the, well, you bless each one of us, dear Father. We thank you and we honor you. For it is in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, you can uh, refresh yourself as you leave our time today. Please, as you go, the students. All right, so uh, students, thank you very much for attending this session. Remember, we are supposed to be having our individual attacks from the from the conversation that we had. So these are kind requests that uh, you will be getting that assignment to your class rep, right? So that remember, we've not done the individual assignments. And the rest. So, class reps, I'll be sending you the, the assignment regarding what has just happened here so that you can do a quick analysis of today's session. For the students that are in the teaching, and we are great that you've been taking that. So, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, who is that? Rose, Yes. Yeah, there's some. Who wants to take a photo with the lecturer? Let's see that. Lecturer? 